beings on this planet are affected by atmospheric phenomena we call the weather. Weather systems determine when and where to produce our food, how our infrastructure must be built to be resilient, or when to prepare for different climate hazards. Because of this, humans have invented all sorts of measuring tools to understand future climate conditions, which lucky for us means we have loads of data from observations. All of this data, of course, has been on quite a technology journey. From being collected on paper, to being uploaded on local servers in basements, to being moved to open platforms that normalize all the different data formats from sensors into cloud servers. This has been thanks to the labor of love of so many that know how valuable it is to get this information into as many hands to find more solutions faster. It's also been incredibly challenging to compute weather models. Historically, these have been physics-based. This means that many combinations are calculated in order to simulate natural forces. This requires loads of expensive and time-consuming computer resources. And by the time calculations are finished, it's common for weather patterns to have changed. Up until recently, this has been changing by building predictive models with a radically different approach using an AI technique that uses neural networks called deep learning. In this case, we use satellite images that have labels of phenomena to train a model to make weather predictions. Unlike traditional physics simulations, we do not need to feed it a sequence of complex rules to calculate many weather forces. Instead, neural networks are not so literal. They take a step back and find visual patterns of cloud behavior from satellite images based on past examples. This is similar to how we process information with our eyes. Here's a quick example. Assume we analyze two planets. They both have gravitational pools that affect each other. Now add more planets to the system, there's additional gravitational interactions to now account for. Calculating the forces between all of them grows into exponential combinations. On the other hand, training a model using neural networks by observing the behavior of different initial states from a variety of planetary systems, along with what happens as the next step, it eventually helps make predictions without having to calculate all the forces. What's even more exciting is that such a model can be shared with others to generate forecasts that are nearly instantaneous. Furthermore, pairing this technique with a powerful data processing hardware like GPUs and TPUs helps users get more accurate predictions at a fraction of the cost and time from standard physics simulations. This is exactly what my peers in Google Research have unlocked. Their model is called MetNet. It performs precipitation forecasts that we see in the evening news at an amazing high spatial resolution of one kilometer within a time resolution of two minutes. It outperforms other traditional models that forecast up to seven to eight hours. This can help to predict extreme weather, especially as we experience further climate changes. More specifically, it can help forecast severe rainfall in a local region within a relatively short period. Thinking about this problem, I think we had two goals in mind. One is that um, we want to capture the dynamics, but uh, in addition, we didn't want to create any very expensive or complicated physics, and so we wanted to pursue a physics-free approach. That is, we want to predict the weather purely by example. We can take examples that have been collected from satellites and radar stations over the last few years and use those as examples uh, to, to train a neural network to make predictions about the future. Google has been an excellent place to pursue this work for many reasons. One of them is that we have scalable cloud platforms that make it possible to develop very large scale models and study them on large scale problems. The other reason is that when we study the Earth, 
The data sets that we work with are large. The Earth is large. And if we want to work, if we want to understand the Earth at very high resolution, these are very large data sets. And they're really out of reach a person who would, might want to download those data sets and use them to study weather forecasting at home. In contrast, at Google, using our cloud platforms, we can download these large data sets and make them available to everybody, anybody who wants to study this work. And so what we found is that the results of our research are useful not only to make scientific impact, but to make this technology accessible to anyone who has the desire to study it. In honor of this awesome data analytics problem, let's see how to approach it via an architecture diagram. We will use Google Earth Engine's data sources and Google Cloud's computing resources. For this US-based sample, we'll use three data sets from the Google Earth Engine catalog. The first data set is GOES-16 from NOAA, which stands for the National Oceanic Atmospheric Association. It collects information every 30 minutes, which is great for real-time monitoring for weather or wildfires, for example. This is possible because the GO system uses satellites stationed above the equator and are synced to match the Earth's orbit, so it's only available in the Americas. Each picture has a resolution of 2,000 meters per pixel. We'll talk about this later. The second data set is the Global Precipitation Measurement or GPM by NASA. It includes the amount of precipitation measured in millimeters per hour. It has a resolution of about 10,000 meters per pixel. And the third data set is global elevation. Next, we ask ourselves what our input data and output labels are. For inputs, we'll use data from GOES, GPM, along with elevation. For outputs, which is how we label our predictions, we'll use GPM's precipitation labels to predict the future. We pair inputs with their respective labels together into a training example. These are where our model will learn from. After identifying our inputs and outputs, let's export our training examples into a training dataset by using a Dataflow pipeline in Google Cloud. Dataflow is a data processing service that helps speed up the export process from hours to minutes using the Earth Engine's high volume endpoint. We typically use stratified sample to gather a balanced amount of points per classification, but because we're working with regression, we have to bucket our labels into classification types. We do this by turning all our numeric labels into integers, so they all fall into a bucket. We chose 31 buckets that represent 0 to 30 millimeters of precipitation per hour. And then, for example, if we choose 100 points for each classification bucket and then grab 1,000 random dates, we end up with around 3 million training examples. Note we choose to make two predictions, one at two and six hours in the future. But you can make as many as desired. And in terms of the amount of inputs needed, the more past data, the better. But we have found that at least three input points are needed to give enough context to make any predictions in the future. In our case, we chose to feed our model with data from the current time and at two and four hours in the past. Since we are using PyTorch, an ML library, we save each training example into a compressed NumPy file format into cloud storage. Next, we write a script to train the model. First, it splits our dataset 90-10. 90% used for training the model and 10% used for testing the model's accuracy on data it has never seen before. Then we define our model, but there are some things to consider. Satellite sensors can give very large numbers, but our model prefers smaller numbers. So we create a normalization layer from the training dataset, which gets your raw inputs and normalizes them into smaller values. Then we pass the normalized inputs through a 2D convolutional network. For simplicity, we only use a 2D convolutional layer followed by a 2D deconvolutional layer. Each layer is connected by a ReLU layer since it's a good general purpose activation function. 
Next, we need to know what our goal is. In this case, it's regression. If you are new to machine learning, I highly recommend checking out our eight minute episode on what is deep learning. As mentioned in that episode, we choose different output activation functions based on our goal. Typically for regression, we use a linear activation function, but here we can't have negative precipitation. Because of this, we can use ReLU instead because it replaces negative values with zero. So we end up with only non-negative values. Finally, we train the model in Vertex AI and save the trained model in the PyTorch model file format into cloud storage. We can eventually host it into Cloud Run, which is a web hosting service. And finally, in order to visualize our predictions as a map, we can use a notebook like Colab, or we can bring it back into Earth Engine. So what's next? If you would like to review this process in greater detail, in the description below, I have included the link to an interactive notebook with all the code used to build this sample. It's written by two very passionate humans on my team. One is my manager, Brijesh, and the other is David, who co-designs this series with me. You can also find a blog post and several helpful resources too. And community, I'll leave you with a fun fact from Jason about the project before we end. If you found this content helpful, you can subscribe to follow us on this journey. Cheers. I believe that we are at a time that's really a turning point for our study of our planet and the environment and the weather and climate. We also have an unprecedented amount of information that's available and public that you can use to understand the Earth. And we have an opportunity to use this kind of information to increase our understanding of the Earth and form a kind of dialogue where we listen to what's happening on the Earth and we make use of that in making decisions, addressing problems that are really interesting and really important. And I feel grateful that I can do this.